Welcome to the Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Saturday, June the 13th, 2020. There are also people in the park who we don't know if they were part of the Black Lives Matter movement or not, but they were also chasing those protesters. So a pretty tense standoff between police, the counter demonstrators and people, members of the public who are also here in the park. And I just want to bring in um, Lena. Lena was somebody who you were in the park uh, today. You were basically frightened, weren't you, when you saw up to 200 of those protesters come into the park, but you ran directly towards those protesters. Tell us exactly what happened. So I was, like, down there by the edge of Hyde Park. I was just chilling. Nothing was really happening. Like, there was no violence or anything. And then I see this big group of white men, and I was guessing that they, they were the EDL people because they were carrying beers and they just looked drunk. And like, So I just I just went towards them, and I was just like... I just was there and I was just like, I don't like you guys. You guys are racist. And then they, one of the guys threw a bottle at me. Some guy tripped me up. They were just all, like, they all just ran towards me. I didn't care, though. I kept going. But they were just reckless, like, disgusting. I don't, yeah, man, it just made me so... I witnessed what happened to you and I saw you, you know, you were, ch- you, you were pushed and you fell onto the floor backwards. At that point, a convoy of police officers entered the park and they all then ran off. Were you were you not worried about your safety? Why did you run towards them? The thing is, I feel like I'm 16 years old. I feel like I have a purpose to serve, especially in times like this. Like, I don't really care for my safety, to be honest, because if I'm seeing people dying left, if I'm seeing people dying just like that, innocent people dying, I don't really care for my safety because I feel like that's my purpose to try to try and protect these people. And to be honest, the police, when they came, as soon as that happened, when I was on the floor, uh, like, so many policemen came, but they were just, they didn't, like, they didn't arrest those people. They just, they tried to block me from them, but they never, like, served justice. They never went for those people that attacked me. They just tried to, like... Yeah, I don't really, yeah. I think the reason for that, Lena, is because they were trying to protect you. They're trying to build a barrier between you and those protesters, and it's worth saying... Yeah, yeah, they, they're trying to build a barrier between you and the protesters, my foot. Um, no, that was Sky News that you heard that audio from. And 16-year-old Lena is more brave than many people are. She represents a younger generation that is fearless, that is tired, that has seen nothing but war and student debt and joblessness and lies and racism and misogyny and anti-Islamic behavior and other forms of Islamophobia and hate. They've seen that all their lives. And she is 16. Unafraid. This episode of The Politocrat deal with the violent, racist people who were fighting with police today in London around Parliament Square And we'll also deal with the way the news media has been covering the Black Lives Matter protests and how they have also not been clear, and this is by design, about just exactly who is committing the violence here during these protests. That's coming up next when I return.
What you just heard there for the last 45 seconds or so were scenes from today's... I wouldn't call these folks protesters. These are right-wing extremists. In fact, that's too kind. They are racists. These are white men who were in Parliament Square in London today. The vast majority of them were there to commit violence. And they were fighting against the police. Fighting against the police. They claimed that they were there to protect the statue of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, as many of you know, led the United Kingdom in wartime. Winston Churchill, as you know, led the United Kingdom in wartime, was the face of England, and was someone who led the country out and defeated tyranny and defeated the Nazis and Hitler. That's why the statue of Winston Churchill is there in Parliament Square in central London. Look, don't get me wrong. Winston Churchill was a racist and was absolutely abhorrent in many aspects and what he did to the Turks, the Kurds rather, in the early part of the 1900s, gassing them, bombing them. He committed atrocities. There's no question about Churchill had done that. And there's no question that he was a racist. You can go and look at some of the racist things he said. There's no question about it. And that must be told. That story of Churchill is often whitewashed, for lack of a better term, and is not taught in schools, is not taught in England. When I was growing up in England, I never heard this about Winston Churchill. I had to learn that on my own, my own study, my own reading of books, outside of school curricula where I learned that Winston Churchill did these heinous and racist things. There's no question about that and that he was a racist. Talked about African people not being the equals of whites and all kinds of other racist things that he said. He led England bravely and powerfully against the Nazis and defeated Hitler and Nazi Germany and basically saved the world, quite frankly, from complete Nazi dominance. His statue should stay where it is. And as a matter of fact, his statue had been boarded up. In fact, it had been boarded up completely much to the chagrin and dismay of many people in the UK, had been boarded up yesterday, Friday. So what were these racists coming to protect? They weren't there to protect Hitler. Yeah, Freudian slip. They weren't there to protect Churchill. They were there to salute Hitler. They were against Churchill because... In videos that I've posted on Twitter at the popcorn R E E L, you can see Nazi salutes by these thugs in Parliament Square, not far away at all from the boxed up statue of Winston Churchill. So Churchill defeated the Nazis in the 1940s. Britain was blitz. The blitz had gone on forever, it seemed. For at least a month or so, if not more. 
And all of that only for these 21st century Nazis to descend upon Parliament Square today and throw Nazi salutes and fight with the cops, the Metropolitan Police. Really? We have not fully defeated Nazism. I guess Churchill perhaps did not do a good enough job. These are thugs and racists, and it is clear that these are thugs and racists. You have to just go on my Twitter page, at the popcorn, R-E-E-L, and go ahead and look at all the video I've posted from people, from media people who have been on scene. One of those that you just heard there was the sound of a camera being, or a phone, being smacked out of the hand of a journalist. Matthew Thompson of LBC had his phone smacked out of his hand. And even in his tweet, which you will see on my Twitter feed, even in his tweet, he doesn't call these white racist thugs. Thugs. He doesn't call them thugs. He doesn't call them violent people. He calls them protesters. Well, my question is to Matthew or anybody else in the media is what are they protesting? When you go on a protest, you typically see signs. Where were their signs? Where were their placards? If they're supposedly protesting against people defacing Churchill statue, and there were people who did that last week, they wrote on it correctly that he was a racist, which he was. And I don't condone bringing down the statue of Churchill or even, quite frankly, even defacing it. And I think, and as I told you, he was an absolute racist. I support Winston Churchill's statue staying exactly where it is. What I do not support are thuggish people. In this specific case, these thuggish white men who are not coming to peacefully protest anything. They are there to be violent. They are there to start trouble. They are there to have a confrontation with Black Lives Matter protesters. And for the news media in the UK, whether it's LBC or Sky News, not to point this out, not to talk about the violence that was right there in front of them on their cameras. I mean, I'm sitting there watching Sky News. And you see literally hordes and hordes and hordes of white men throwing bottles, throwing their fists, attacking police. And the voiceover from the journalist is, oh, protesters, protesters, they're just protesters, not even saying anything about them being violent, nothing at all on the Chiron about violent protesters, so-called protesters. I guarantee you, if that were Black Lives Matter protesters, you would have seen the Chiron say violence at Black Lives Matter protests. You would have heard the journalists say, these are violent people in this movement. But the media completely underplays what happened today. The vast majority of the media in the UK, well, let me just stick to England because there are still other countries in the United Kingdom, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, who may not have characterized these violent men as protesters. I mean, if you look at the video, it's very clear that these people are violent. They don't have any placards. They don't have any protest signs. Where are their protest signs about save Churchill? Where are their protest signs about, well, you know what? Leave these statues alone. 
There was none of that. These folks organized and coordinated this. In fact, Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, made it very clear that people should stay out of the capital because of the increasing rates of COVID-19 that were coming due to these large gatherings and to Boris Johnson's government reopening things. Let's not forget that. And also due to the fact that there was to be an expected right-wing pushback. These racists pushing back against peaceful Black Lives Matter protesters. That is really what this was about. And Black Lives Matter had cancelled their protest for Saturday, which is today. And had a protest on Friday, yesterday. And in fact, still had a smaller protest today in parts of London, Hyde Park in particular, where these white racists, thugs, were looking to disrupt. They were looking to start trouble. And the video that I played you at the very beginning of this episode, a 16-year-old girl with nothing to lose, says she didn't care about her safety, squared off against these advancing hundreds, hundreds of white thugs, of thugs. And they kicked her and threw bottles at her. These are cowards. And what I'm really hacked off about here is that the media just completely makes them neutral. In fact, all of this coverage that I saw on Sky News today was all about, oh, protesters. The words that you heard all the time were protesters, protesters, counter-demonstrators, protesters. And there was a complete blurring of the lines, a very deliberate blurring of the lines. If you just closed your eyes and just listened to the audio of these journalists, you wouldn't know whom was whom. You would have had no idea who the Black Lives Matter people were and who these white racists, violent, these thugs were. There's this conflation going on in the media, whether it's in the UK or whether it's here in the United States, and it's very deliberate. There is this failure, deliberate failure, to inquire upon the arrests. Did the police arrest any of these thugs today in Parliament Square? Well, the official story is that five people were arrested. Five. And if you look at these videos, as I said, they are on my Twitter timeline today, at the popcorn, R-E-E-L. You will see that there were more than five people throwing bottles, more than five people punching and attacking police. How, is, how on earth are five people arrested in that melee of people? You'll see it. You know very well that if these were black people who were engaged in scuffles and melee with police, they would have been shot dead. And I know most people, most police in England don't have guns. They would have probably had the armed squad come in and shot them. Or they would have been arrested right there. The police are protecting these thugs. These people are throwing Nazi salutes. And they should be arrested for that alone. I hear you now, free speech. This is hatred. This is free hatred. It's not free speech. It's free hatred without consequence. This is just really evil stuff. And the media is participating in this complete whitewashing of this violence that is right before your very eyes. And it's so interesting to me that two weeks ago here in the United States, everything on CNN, every other second was, now let's go to 
Los Angeles, where there's a car on fire. Now let's go to Seattle, where there's another car on fire. Now let's go to Washington, D.C., where there's a hotel on fire. These were all orchestrated events. The vast majority of this violence here in the U.S. was orchestrated by these racist, white, right-wing groups. These white dominance groups who believe in controlling everybody who doesn't look like them and believes in committing violence against everybody who doesn't look like them. Let's call this out for exactly what it is. The media looking to find instances where there may be people in the Black Lives Matter movement, a small percentage of people who, by the way, are being infiltrated by these white racist groups like the Proud Boys. And looking to stir that up and say, oh, there's violence in that group while completely ignoring the violence that's right before their very eyes in London, while completely ignoring the violence committed by police here in the U.S. The police violence was indiscriminate these last two, three weeks. Indiscriminate. They went and attacked members of the media and still there were some in the media who would not cover it. Australian reporters being attacked, Australian camera crew being attacked right there in Washington, D.C. Literally, literally 12 days ago, 12 days ago, and the media was nowhere to be found. Most of the media completely ignored it. You know, you know where you saw all the coverage online. On the online editions of these very same people who on TV, these very same channels, would not show this stuff on television. Why not? Why wouldn't you want your viewers to see that? Because you wanted to paint a narrative that said that it was the protesters who were doing this so that when Donald Trump came out there and tear gassed these people, which you couldn't ignore because it was live on television, so your cameras had to show it. So that when he would come out there, when he really wanted to attack protesters who were peaceful anyway, he didn't want a photo op. The photo op was the excuse. What he really wanted to do was attack peaceful people. But the whole idea of demonizing days and days beforehand, over that whole weekend and the weekend prior, the whole idea of that was to excuse Donald Trump tear gassing. That's why the media, in my view, did it. You can call me conspiratorial. But these are subliminal things that happen. And make no mistake, there are some people who are watching those pictures of tear gassing. And I guarantee you, somewhere in this country, called the United States of America, there was at least one or two people subliminally in their minds saying, well, you know, they kind of deserve it because look at all the cars that were burned over the weekend. Look at all the, the hotels that had fire coming out of them. Look at the fact that a precinct was burned in Minneapolis. Never mind the fact that a white guy was arrested for that. 23, a 23-year-old white guy was arrested for that. Did that make major news on television? No, it didn't. But I did see it in various publications online. Washington Post, numerous ones. Why isn't the media properly reporting on this? I mean, I've given you a couple of my thoughts about it, but what do you think? Why do you think that the news media, whether it's here in the US or in the United Kingdom, is not properly really getting a grasp on this and deliberately and clearly calling out these white people, white men predominantly, who are committing this violence? Why are they not doing that? Is there a certain message that they want to send? Is there a certain picture that they want to paint? What do you think the reason is? I've got some other information that you may not 
be so aware of. And it ties right in to what I've been talking about. Next. Welcome back. Many of you listening may not have been aware of what happened on June the 1st in Philadelphia. I mean, this is exactly what I've been talking about. June 1st was the day where Donald Trump ordered police in Washington, D.C. to tear gas peaceful protesters. Here's what happened also that same day in Philadelphia. This is from the Guardian newspaper. The Guardian headline from uh, Man V. Singh is the writer. M-A-A-N-V-I Singh. S-I-N-G-H is the person's last name. And here's what he or she or they write. Well, here's the headline. The armed white men who terrorized Philadelphia's Black Lives Matter supporters. And you can find this at theguardian.com. The dateline, Thursday, June the 4th, 2020. The subtitle to the headline, Protesters reported men ripping up signs, yelling homophobic slurs, and spitting on people. And the police greeted them as friends. I'm going to read a part of this and I'm going to play some audio as well that is supplemented with this story. Again, this is from Man V. Singh. Dateline, Thursday, June the 4th, 2020. As thousands in Philadelphia marched to end police brutality against black Americans on Monday, a group of white men carrying bats, golf clubs, and other improvised weapons gathered in the city's Fish Town neighborhood. Drawing comparisons to brown shirts, the group of about 50 to 70 men were filmed heckling and threatening a small group of protesters in the neighborhood. One of the men was recorded ripping up a protester's Black Lives Matter sign while yelling homophobic slurs A producer for WHYY, the local public radio station, tweeted that he was beaten up after trying to film the group. A few men were spotted with rifles. So you had people with rifles there as well, on top of everything else. This is June the 1st. June the 1st. And this was within an hour, within an hour or so, I guess. At least it was tweeted about an hour or so, or just around the time that Donald Trump has sent these goons in the Gestapo, the SS, to Lafayette Park, to Lafayette Square, and gas these peaceful protesters to violate the First Amendment right before the eyes of the world. Here's what was happening in Philadelphia. Joshua Potash, who is on Twitter, at Joshua Potash, tweets, these white people are now roaming Philly with the blessing of the police. This is what the President of the United States just endorsed. And what you will see in that video, there's no real audio to it. People, these white men, with golf clubs and baseball bats, walking the streets. Here is That audio. Now, you're not going to really hear a lot, but I'm going to just play it for you. It's about 30 seconds or so, if that.
Now, why would you be walking the streets of Philadelphia knowing that protests and protesters are peaceful in the city of brotherly love, as it is called? Not so brotherly or lovely with Frank Rizzo, the mayor and former police chief, openly being racist and beating up people and calling for cops to do that. And that led to MOVE being bombed roughly 15 years or so later. But what are you doing walking the streets of Philadelphia? Knowing that the protests have been peaceful, why on earth are you walking down the streets with golf clubs and baseball bats? Why are you doing that? Why are you walking with rifles? Why are you ripping up people's signs? Would you be ripping up swastikas? If there were people holding up swastikas, would these white men be walking down the streets with baseball bats? Would these white men be walking down the streets with golf clubs? Would these white men be ripping up Nazi swastikas? I'm going to read some more of this story from The Guardian. Clara, 30, a Fishtown resident who encountered the group as she set out of her house on Monday evening. This is back on June 1st of this year. 2020, with two of her roommates carrying Black Lives Matter signs, told The Guardian that one of the men shoved her roommate and spat on her. Quote, he said he had COVID, in quote, said Clara, who asked The Guardian to identify her by her nickname for fear of reprisal. Quote, If they felt so bold as to spit on us and shove us in broad daylight in front of a police station, what would they do to a more vulnerable person? Now listen to the rest of this. And whereas the Philadelphia police kettled in hundreds of peaceful protesters marching along the expressway just southwest of Fishtown, and doused them in tear gas even before the city's 6 p.m. curfew hit on Monday. They did little to rein in the group of white, self-described vigilantes, witnesses said. Vigilantes. These aren't vigilantes. These are thugs. These are violent cowards. And these are racists. End of story. Welcome back. I just wanted to continue with this story in The Guardian. And you're going to be hearing some audio in a few short moments. And I'm going to get to the crux of really where all of this is really leading to and what the genesis of this is. And this is something that you need to know in case you aren't aware of it. And I'll get to that also very shortly. Back to the Guardian story. Quote, they were carrying baseball bats and golf clubs, the most white bully weapons, end quote said Josh Goldblum, 39, a Fishtown resident who encountered the armed, self-described vigilantes on Monday as he made his way back from the protest in other parts of the city. Quote, and they were acting like a bunch of street police, end quote. Before I continue, that begs the question, 
Were any of these people police? Were they off-duty police? Were they police undercover? Did any of them know the police? I mean, that's the critical question that I would be asking. If they did this in front of a police station and the police, as some said, basically did it, basically allowed them, allowed them to do it. Then that begs the question, not only that they're protecting white men with weapons and say, go ahead, do what you want to do. The second question after that, or the second or the issue after that is, how many of these people were cops? How many of these white men with guns and golf clubs and freaking baseball bats, how many of them were police? We know that police were committing violent acts in Minnesota. We know that. We know that police were smashing in parts of AutoZone stores. I've posted video of uniformed police smashing windows of storefronts. So the police are definitely egging on this violence. The police are starting the violence. They're committing the violence. They're doing it against journalists. They're doing it against peaceful protesters. Then you've got these police who don't have badges or name tags or identifying marks. What is this? The SS? The Gestapo? What is this? This country is unrecognizable now. But the DNA of this has been here for centuries. We know that there's been a history of police being in white racist groups like the Klan and numerous others. We know that the police have been absolutely part of the Klan. We know that the Klan exists in the police departments. Now, you can have all the reform bills that you want, Governor Cuomo, but what about addressing that central issue? What about addressing the issue also of the fact that you've got white racists in the police department and then some of those white racists are tied to the Klan, are members of the Klan? This has been going on in this country forever, where you've had police and a Klan intermingle together. They're part of the same group. They are interchangeable. I mean, the police in this country came from enslavement patrols. Goldblum said he was tear gassed while protesting earlier that day, but that the 12 to 15 police officers patrolling a main thoroughfare in Fishtown did little to rein in the armed men. Quote, these guys who were obviously looking for some trouble weren't being policed at all, he said even as they converged in front of the local police precinct. A couple of other paragraphs and warning here, a warning. There is going to be some language spoken that is highly objectionable to some people and I find it objectionable personally. And I, I don't think I can even say that word. Put it this way. It's a four letter word that women can say to each other because they do. And um, I know in the UK, this word is something that's bandied about a lot. Um, but I find it to be. Um, misogynistic and offensive. So I'm not going to say the word. Although the woman quoted in this Guardian story actually says the word. Quote, they were screaming things like you pussy ass C word. You know what that word is, a four letter word. Said Jill St. Clair, 30, who encountered the men while walking her dog with her boyfriend. 
St. Clair said she was dismissed by a 911 dispatcher. So the dispatcher just dismissed her, ignored her, didn't take her, her claim seriously. She said an officer at the local precinct told her to, quote, be grateful for those men and they were indeed keeping me safe. What? That's me saying what? St. Clair's boyfriend, John Entwistle, 33, said one of the on-duty officers he spoke with said he was friends with some of the armed locals who had gathered in Fishtown. Quote, he said they knew each other through local athletic leagues or whatever. End quote, Entwistle said. Quote, and when you saw them, they were smiles. It was friendly, end quote. So what John Entwistle is saying is that these cops knew some of these guys. Just as I was saying a few moments ago. But how many of them were police? Here's some of the audio. Listen to this audio here from Philadelphia. This actually was posted by Dazzlestorm on Twitter. At Dazzlestorm. Listen to this. You just want peace. We just want peace. And you heard the ripping of a Black Lives Matter sign. I mean, if you look at that video, and I will uh, retweet that video so you'll see it at the popcorn R E E L on my timeline. But if you watch that video, you will see that one of these cowards ripped, one of these white cowards, white male cowards ripped, ripped a sign out of the hands of a young white protester. I mean, I think it was a young girl, young white girl with the Black Lives Matter sign. And he goes over and rips it, rips this sign out of her hand and rips the sign in half, tears it. These guys are advancing towards this small group with bats and golf clubs. Why was the media not covering that? Why did I have to read this in The Guardian? And why wasn't it on television? Maybe it was in Philadelphia locally on their local television. Maybe it wasn't. But I just find that the media has absolutely abdicated any responsibility to tell the complete picture of any kind of story. It's not like this just began. This has been going on in the media for such a long time. It's this very pro-establishment, pro-quote-unquote law and order, or I should say no law and plenty of disorder that we see going on right now with the police. Why do you think that people are out in the streets protesting against police? Why do you think some people are calling for police to be defunded? And by the way, defunding does not mean abolishing. It means reallocating financial resources to where they can be better used rather than militarizing police. Maybe you want to fund education, which has been defunded in this country called the U.S. of A. for many years now, around the time of Reagan, and it continued. Maybe even before that, it was defunded. Education budgets have gone down, particularly under Republican presidents. Why isn't there any outrage by the media about that? All this stuff on TV about defund the cops, what do you mean? And they bring on these guests, many of them in law enforcement. Oh, well, I don't agree with that. What about people in education? What about the school teachers? What about the students who are constantly having education defunded? Why isn't there any conversation around that on television? Why is there almost no conversation in the media ever 
about education and about schools, unless it's to do with a school shooting in this country. And even then, it's not about the books and the textbooks. Where are the on-camera cable news television stories about the continuous and continual defunding of education, taking money out of education in this country, which Betsy DeVos has been doing as the education secretary, which Trump has been doing. These guys aren't educated, and even if they were, these thugs that you just heard in that audio are extremely dangerous. And what's just as dangerous, if not more so, are the police who allow it to happen. Where's that story on CNN? So you've got police committing violence, smashing storefront windows, setting cars on fire, all these false flag operations going on in order to discredit a movement. And you've got these police hardly arresting anybody, hardly arresting anybody in London today. In Parliament Square, any of these white thugs who had been running around fighting police and trying to terrorize and actually terrorizing a 16 year old girl and these other Black Lives Matter protesters. You've got all that going on. You've got the protection of that. You've got the media covering and and trying to conflate protesters and demonstrators with these thugs who claim that they were there to protect Churchill's statue and they're giving Nazi salutes. This is a disaster. It's all deliberate in my view. Here's the point that I want to finally get to here. February 5th, 2020. CBS News headline from Aaron Donahue. Racially motivated violent extremists elevated to national threat priority, FBI director says. The director of the FBI is Christopher Ray. Here's what he said just a few months ago this year to Nora O'Donnell. So I think the threat, today's terrorism threat, still includes sleeper cells, Al-Qaeda, all the kind of major terrorist organizations that you would think of. But we're also very focused now on homegrown violent extremists, which are people who are largely here already in the United States, big cities, small towns, coast to coast. And these are people who are largely radicalized online. How do you keep them from becoming radicalized online? Well, the online issue is a challenge, right? Terrorism today moves at the speed of social media. Part of it is engaging with social media companies in a way to try to get them to do certain things they can do voluntarily. And is Silicon Valley being helpful? Uh, We are getting much better cooperation than we used to. I think everybody's learning. I think there's a view that this is a shared threat, shared not just between law enforcement and intelligence, but shared between government and the private sector. Now, in that clip, the FBI director didn't mention the word white or racist, but it is clear if you look at the story that I just gave you the headline for from Aaron Donahue on February 5th, 2020, it is clear the story itself talks about racists. And Christopher Ray testified at a hearing this year and I think last year as well before Congress. I know that two of his high-ranking officials did this year. I mean, excuse me, back in uh, 2019, just a year ago, June the 4th of last year, testified about white racists being the most dangerous group of terrorists that America has. And in this article by Aaron Donahue for February 5th, 2020, I'm going to just read you this. The FBI has elevated its assessment of the threat posed by racially motivated 
And that's really their code word for white racist. Violent extreme, extremists. If, if it were black people, they would have said black. Trust me. The FBI has elevated its assessment of the threat posed by racially motivated violent extremists in the U.S. to a, quote, national threat priority for fiscal year 2020, FBI Director Christopher Wray said Wednesday. He said the FBI is placing the risk of violence from such groups on the same footing as threats posed by the country, posed to the country by foreign terrorist organizations such as ISIS and its sympathizers. Not only is the terror threat diverse, it's unrelenting, quote, Ray said at an oversight hearing before the House Judiciary Committee. Racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists or domestic terrorists motivated by racial or religious hatred make up a, quote, huge chunk, in quote, of the FBI's direct domestic terrorism investigations, Ray said in statements before the Senate Homeland Security Committee last November. The majority of those attacks, Ray said, are, quote, fueled by some type of white supremacy. His statements indicate the FBI is just as concerned about racially motivated violent extremists, including white supremacists, as it is about the threat posed by homegrown violent extremists and by, inspired by foreign terrorist organizations. Ray said both pose a grave threat because the perpetrators are often, quote, lone actors, self-radicalized online, who often look to attack soft targets such as public gatherings, retail locations, or houses of worship. Now, we saw that. We saw that, did we not, in 2018? Did we not see that in 2018, the Tree of Life Synagogue? Did we not see that October of that year? Did people forget? Did people forget that in 2015, in fact, we're coming up on the commemoration of that now from five years ago, June the 17th it was, 2015. Did people forget about a white racist who murdered nine black parishioners inside a Mother AME church, Mother Emmanuel, down there in Charleston, South Carolina. Did people forget that already? Did people forget about Christ Church in New Zealand? Where a white male who claimed that he loved Trump and all of this, and that he had a manifesto and it had Trump's name on it, did, did and he murdered... 50 Muslim people murdered them in Christchurch, New Zealand. The Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, got rid of guns within two weeks after that incident. No more guns. These assault rifles, gone. No more, gone. America will never do anything like that. No matter how many shootings this country has. Did people forget about El Paso, Texas? Just last year, this guy shot and killed 27 people. And the police, and it was a white guy that did this, by the way. And the police casually arrested him, didn't throw him to the ground, didn't put a knee in his neck, didn't draw their guns. And by the way, when that racist in South Carolina murdered those nine black parishioners, In the house of worship, the police ended up buying him Burger King. So the police have had a long history of coddling up to white male racists and just white people generally, treating them historically and currently very differently, very favorably, even when they are doing things that are patently illegal, dangerous, criminal, they get favorable treatment from the police and from the press. And you've got the FBI director telling you about what's going on. You've got in the military an infiltration by white racists. It's been going on forever.
February 21st, 2019, CBS News headline, Coast Guard officer arrested on gun charges had hit list of prominent Democrats, Fed say. This is Stephen Beckett writing this. I'm going to read this to you because much of this article doesn't even mention the fact that this guy is a white racist who who admits that he is and admits that he's a so-called white nationalist. And I really hate that term because it completely waters down what these people really are, which is racist, which are Nazis, which is not. That's what these folks are. Nationalist. Anything to soften it when it's someone who's doing this, who is white. There's this rush to excuse everything. There's this rush to sanitize everything. Here is what some of what Stephen Beckett says. Or maybe what I will do is play some of this audio here. Because maybe this audio might bring it home even better than I do. I mean, this is just unbelievable, but it's not unbelievable because this is the history of this country. It is a complete whitewashing of anything that white people do that's criminal. Police don't do anything about it. Black people are being brutalized and beaten. Brown people brutalized and attacked and beaten, thrown into concentration camps. And people just move on like nothing's happened. And then the media just pretends as if this is all. Oh, it's just some drunken people. Yeah, whenever white men commit violence, they're always drunk. It's not that they're just thugs. Listen to this from CBS News. Coast Guard Lieutenant. Prosecutors are calling him a domestic terrorist, a self-described white nationalist with a collection of weapons and a list of people he wanted to kill, including U.S. senators and media personalities. David Martin reports. The motion to keep Coast Guard Lieutenant Christopher Hassan in jail until he can be brought to trial warns that he intends to murder innocent civilians on a scale rarely seen in this country. It quotes a draft email in which he says, I am dreaming of a way to kill almost every last person on the earth. Start with biological attacks, followed by attacks on food supply. Institute a bombing sniper campaign. When federal agents searched his basement apartment in the suburbs of Washington, they found 15 firearms and over 1,000 rounds of ammunition. They also found a hit list, which reads like a who's who of liberal politics. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer, and presidential contenders Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and Cory Booker. The list also includes television anchors from MSNBC and CNN. According to court documents, Hassan, who once served in the Marines, described himself as a longtime white nationalist who supports the idea of a white homeland. He read the writings of a Norwegian domestic terrorist named Anders Breivik, who eight years ago went on a rampage which killed 77 Norwegians, many of them teenage summer campers. Officials say they believe Hassan was not just fantasizing, but was serious about carrying out his plans for mass murder. He is scheduled to appear in court tomorrow. Jeff? The serving case, David Martin, thank you very much. Now that is the only, and that was from 2019, that report. When your psoriasis is bad, it can be hard to see what's possible. Well, that is possible. (laughs) That was from 2019, that report. And it's the only report that I have come across. And there are other reports, but that's the only one that I think conveys just some of how serious, how very deeply serious... And disturbing this all is. These folks have been in the Coast Guard and in other areas of the armed forces and the military for such a long time. And they go into the military having come from some hate group or they go right back into the hate group, the racist group. 
after they have left the military and they carry around all this paramilitary stuff, all these guns and these weapons. Why isn't the media focusing more on this, especially now when it is clear in Las Vegas, in Las Vegas, just a few days ago, there was the arrest of three men who plotted to terrorize the protests by Black Lives Matter in Las Vegas. Federal prosecutors, this is from the Washington Post, June 3rd, 2020, written by Michelle Price and Scott Sonner. Three Nevada men with ties to a loose movement of right-wing extremists advocating the overthrow of the United States government have been arrested on terrorism-related charges in what authorities say was a conspiracy to spark violence during recent protests in Las Vegas. Federal prosecutors say the three white men with U.S. military experience are accused of conspiring to carry out a plan that began in April in conjunction with protests to reopen businesses closed because of the coronavirus and later sought to capitalize on protests over the death of George Floyd, a black man who died in Minneapolis after a white officer pressed his knee into his neck for several minutes, even after he stopped moving and pleading for air. The three men were arrested Saturday on the way to a protest in downtown Las Vegas after filling gas cans at a parking lot and making Molotov cocktails in glass bottles, according to a copy of the criminal complaint obtained by the Associated Press. Quote, people have a right to peacefully protest. These men are agitators and instigators. Their point was to hijack the protest into violence, end quote, Nicholas Troutonich, U.S. attorney in Nevada, told AP. He referred to what he called, quote, real and legitimate outrage over Floyd's death. The complaint filed in the U.S. District Court in Las Vegas on Wednesday said they self-identified as part of the, quote, Boogaloo movement, which U.S. prosecutors said in the document is, quote, a term used by extremists to signify coming civil war and or fall of civilization, end quote. Stephen Parshall, 35, Andrew T. Lynham, Jr., 23, and William Loomis, 40, were being held on one million bond each, one million dollars bond each in the Clark County Jail Wednesday, according to court records. Each currently faces two federal charges, conspiracy to damage and destroy by fire and explosive and possession of unregistered firearms. In state court, they've been accused of felony conspiracy, terrorism, and explosives possession. Now, if Nicholas Troutonich, the U.S. attorney in Nevada, can say that these men, cowards, had the point to attack and hijack protests into violence, what about all of these protests that I've been playing audio for in recent episodes of this podcast, where you actually had... Black Lives Matter people saying, no, don't come in here. You're not going to loot the store. Aren't these people part of that movement? Could they be? These people that want to loot these stores? These white people who had hammers, white women and men? I saw videos of that from Oakland, California. I posted them. They were online and they were smashing windows with hammers. And they were all dressed in black. There needs to be an honest, open, not just conversation, but a depiction by the media of these thugs who are going around looting and agitating and trying to disrupt what has been an enormously successful movement and continues to be. We are on the 19th consecutive day of peaceful protesting. All over the country and all around the world, people are continuing to protest These violent police protest against these police who killed George Floyd, protesting in the name of justice for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and David McAtee and Ahmaud Arbery. And any other black person 
who has been killed by the police. And against thuggery in the police who are going around killing people, going around blinding journalists, journalists losing their eyes. There's a 20-minute reel out there. I couldn't even watch it of all the police violence that's happened in the last week or two alone. I think it's about time that the media also looked up to themselves or looked in the mirror at themselves, I should say, and be responsible because what you're doing now for the vast majority of you is highly irresponsible. Be leaner. And I'm talking about the young 16-year-old woman, the young 16-year-old girl that you heard at the beginning of this episode. Be brave. Be bold. Tell the truth. Make it clear to your viewers, whether you're Sky News or CNN or MSNBC, that these are white thugs. These are thugs who are violent, who are racist, who are attacking peaceful protesters, just like the police are attacking peaceful protesters. Focus on these cowards in Fishtown, in Philadelphia who are just destroying the place, taking signs. What is it? We are in Nazi Germany here. That's what we're seeing. When you've got these thugs with golf clubs and guns and baseball bats, that's the kind of sort stuff I saw when I was in Bensonhurst 30 years ago, walking the streets there. And they were holding up watermelons and basketballs, all these white Italians in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, in the early 1990s, holding up baseball bats and basketballs at all of us as we marched through their racist neighborhood. And they were spitting. Some of them were old men, white men. And they were pulling down their bare pants. So you saw their asses. They were mooning us. Spitting at us. Calling us the N-word. And the police formed a thin, thin cordon between us and these hateful thugs. And they had kids on their shoulders. These are the remnants of the lynching parties that were happening in this country. You are living in a fascist state. And when the media abdicates its responsibility, when the police behave like thugs, when the police become the fascists, we are already in Nazi Germany. We are already in a police state and we are already in a fascist state. When a media equivocates, does both sides, does whataboutism, and doesn't do its job properly, which is why you should be listening to alternative media, like Democracy Now!, like Randy Rhodes, like Tom Hartman, like Roland Martin Unfiltered, like Joe Madison on Sirius XM where you get a full picture of what is going on. Those are my recommendations to you. If you want media, and I'm not saying that the Washington Post doesn't tell some good stories because they do have some great video essays on on there, despite the fact that Bezos owns them. And I'm not saying completely withdraw Although I've done that for a number of years and have only started coming back to watching some of the corporate news media in the last couple of months, last month or so. But what I am saying is if you're fed up of this one-sided coverage that's mealy-mouthed and weak, please go to progressive media like Free Speech TV, freespeech.org, where you can get a wealth of more progressive, more balanced information. And you can get to know about what's going on around the world. 
Thank you for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.